before I make a uh, call to the next person, I just want to acknowledge that, that what I think we all can acknowledge here, right? That small things so often separate organizations. Small things create drama. Small things perpetuate, grow over time into big things in our own minds of how, like, because we all are doing one facet of this work, that somehow the work that someone else is doing is not coming together. It's not building on the work we're doing. And I just want to like encourage everyone here and everyone listening to for a moment to separate yourself from what you've done. Look at the big picture and see all that we can do if we just came together. If we leave the drama, the nuance, the small differences behind and move collectively to actually change the state of Rhode Island in a way that benefits working families in a way that benefits communities of color, which are also working families. Let's be clear. I want to now take some time to introduce my friend. You know, I met him back in uh, 2017. And when I met him, I was really trying to understand why Cape Verdeans in the state of Rhode Island were so often left out of the discussion. Why in our school system were Cape Verdean students always forced to learn Spanish? instead of, like Spanish to English, instead of being taught English directly from their language, especially given that we have had Cape Verdeans here for over 100 years. Over 100 years, we have had communities here that we know need resources and we have ignored them. And that includes our indigenous brothers and sisters. That includes our African American and African communities. I'd love to say that I knew the answer to that, but I didn't. And so I met Professor Silas Pintos, who grew up in South Providence, who has done a lot for the Cape Verdean community, as well as for all communities here in the state of Rhode Island, who brings an understanding of not only culture, but language and the importance of words and how those words carry over into structures. <laughs> so I'm going to start with uh, actually something that I learned very early in martial arts training, which is taking care of your mind, body, and soul, as corny as it sounds. As a fighter, you probably know that um, before you get into the ring or as you're preparing for a fight, you have to go through like a detox, right? Like cleanse your body before you can step in the ring before you go for the real fight. How do we detox our minds is the question that I've been working on over the last 20 plus years. I've been running my center, a martial arts center, a community center for 21 years. And I'm gonna come down to education. We have a super colonized education for our kids. And let me define colonization here, lies. That's the synonym to me. So we can be doing all this work in the community, and then we have our children, and we'd expect them to just kind of pick up where we're leaving off, but we're forgetting sometimes that we're coming to ourselves way later than many of the other people have, because we come to realize, oh goodness, that's what they've been doing to my mind this whole time. And then we're adults. And just a little bit behind again. So we're doing all this wonderful work, and all our kids are going to where? To school. And I want to be very clear. I don't like schools. I love education. I work for the Department of Education at Tufts University. I don't work for the Department of Schools. Education can happen in those buildings that we call schools. It happens at home because no one in schools taught me how to not get my face shot off by somebody else. That was my mom. They had to teach me how to walk down the street. Had to teach me what direction to walk, how close to be walking from buildings or how far. That happened at home. I used to tease my grandmother. She passed away in 92, so she lived a very long life in Cape Verde Islands. And when I asked her, Mimi, what's the hardest thing about growing up and becoming older? And she says, people thinking that I have the answer. I don't have answers. 
So she used to say, point to the things you want people to think about. Now I want you to think about education. I want you to think about the curriculum that we have been designing for schools and passing down to our kids, favoring certain kids and completely erasing and making other communities invisible. We're right here in Rhode Island. Cape Verdeans have been around in Rhode Island for many, many moons. We've been now working with the mayor in the last year to try to bring a little bit of visibility. Cape Verdeans settled in 1850 in New Bedford. It was the first people of African descent to come here by choice, knowing where they come from and knowing what they were going to. And here in Rhode Island, we've been around since 1870s. Do you know that in Providence, we have five Cape Verdean business in all of Providence since 1850. How can that be? How can that be? Well, it's a systemic structural problem. It's by design. It is by design. We attended a uh, Black Prosperity Conference on Wednesday, and the question that was up on the board was, why are we disunited? The word on the board was unit, but why are we not there? And to me, the answer is really simple. It's by design. We were put here this way. We were uprooted, transported, sprinkled all over the world, and now, of course, we're fighting each other with these other titles that never existed before. Racial classification is a new concept. You can date it. It's like 1775, Room and Rock, Germany. Right. You can date it. Humans have been around a lot longer than that. But we're fighting with each other about this racial classification and that one. And I call it a classification because there is no choice. In the United States, if you have one drop of African blood, you were black, period. That's it. And we had an African president and a black president. If you're half and half, what, is that? what does that mean? But why is it in one way? Well, because in the United States, it doesn't matter how white you are in the United States. It matters how black you are, you see? Because blackness, Africanness, gives you downward mobility here. In other country, you can be like the darkest of people, but you had a great, 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 great grandparent from Europe, and it's a point up, not here. It's a structure, it's a system that we have created. And our education curriculum doesn't do that for our kids. We are taught to remain invisible. And then we go through the process, get the paper, first that big paper and then the other kind of paper. <laughs> and then we get really happy, we get settled, and we're thinking, oh, at home we talk about this stuff and our kids are gonna just get it. No, they go back to another place, another space that continues to colonize their minds. And then we spend at home and I have three kids going, really, this is what they're teaching you in school still? Oh man, I'm kind of upset, which is probably why I still do martial arts. I have to go hit that bag, or I have to do something else. We have to start with detoxing our mind, just as we spend time detoxing our bodies. And we also have to detox our souls. We have to reconnect with each other. How many people in the room here speak a Creole? Yeah. I just that. Everyone in this room speaks a Creole. No one told you that. English is the largest Creole in the world. It's a French Creole, people. But why? Why do you have a country like England working so hard, spending billions of dollars, publishing papers to make sure that you don't know that? Why would you want to put English with those other Creoles like Cape Verdeans and Haitians? It's about power. It's about power. Here's an example. Overnight, English people became the poor peasants of their own country for 400 years. French-speaking people became the elite, and then Latin became the language of the church. Trilingual country, just like that. Which is why English people ate cows. French people ate boof. English people ate swine or pigs. French people ate pork. English people had cooks. French people had chefs. English people had pubs. French people had restaurant. English people take a ride. French people transport. English people speak. French people communicate. Do you see it? Our language is colonized. 
and there's language snobbery going all over the place. So when I left South Providence to go study to get my doctorate, I come back and my own family are like, you don't sound right anymore. <laughs> you don't sound like you're one of us anymore. What's up with you? Why did they change you? But they didn't understand that what I figured out was that there was a bridge between English and our Latin-based languages. Because our basics of Cape Verdean, Spanish, Italian, French, Portuguese, is the elevated English. Because it's a Creole. I really appreciated this brother reaching out to me, grabbing me by my dashiki and pulling me into this and saying, look man, you know, I know you've been in Boston, but I still live in South Providence. I can't leave my home. It's a fight, and we're ready to jump into it. So I'm much appreciated to everyone.